last two months, I've had an intern. She's the only one I've pretty much hung out with. She's just behind the computer, um, actually. Do you want to say hi? Sure. Like to? <laughs> yeah, sure. are you talking to Hi, intern. Yeah. Yeah. They're not strange guys that, over the internet. Well, yeah. Hi, True. hello. Hi. She's taking notes, so it um, might help you out with some of the show notes. Wow, this is so professional. Yeah. I know. Where's where's my intern? <laughs> yeah, I thought this was hey, intern. No, she my intern's not here. I mean <laughs> my intern's me. It's my yeah. Hi, what's your name? Esther. Hi Esther, how are you doing? Thanks for helping out. Yeah, of course. It's a pleasure. <laughs> she didn't have a choice. Yeah. She's kind of a hostage. Cool. Ask her what she thinks of me. She'll say really nice things right now. <laughs> So we're with our guest today, Higashiyama Emi, or Emi Higashiyama. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, so we met through, so Emi and I, this is James here. Uh, Emi and I met through Instagram. I followed her Japanese colonial, let me get the, the term right, Japanese colonial. Uh, if you want to look up Emmy's uh, historical preservation of Japanese architecture in Taiwan, check her out. Check her out on Instagram under Japanese Colonial, no space. And uh, she messaged me back with a voice memo, which I found was interesting because I usually get just text. But then she messaged me back, said an article that she's looking to put up about the Hokkien language, or also in Taiwan known as Daiyi. Uh, which is the Taiwanese version of Hokkien, which is sometimes just called Taiwanese, which is kind of a, you know, kind of a, a weird way to describe that language because uh, there's been languages in Taiwan for thousands of years by the aboriginals, and, you know, um, they don't claim to be called Taiwanese, you know, even though they probably have more of a claim to that than, you know, traditional Taiwanese uh, as we know it today. But anyways... How did you know about our interest in language? <laughs> oh, uh, I, well, I was writing this article and my, my background with Taiwanese language, um, my, my family is Taiwanese. And since my grandparents' generation, there was a lot of Japanese influence because they grew up under the colonial period. And we kind of shed a lot of Chinese or like Taiwanese cultural traits, but then the language stayed in the family. So all my grandparents spoke Taiwanese at home, even though they were educated in Japanese in Taiwan. And then my dad's parents stayed in Taiwan, but my dad was born right after World War II, so his education was all in Mandarin. And uh, But he would still go home and speak Taiwanese. On my mom's side, her parents moved to mainland Japan before World War II, and then they just stayed. So my mom was born and raised there in Japan uh, like completely in, in educated in Japanese and her parents didn't want her to speak Japanese weird. So even though they spoke Taiwanese to each other, they, they never taught her. And then, um, 30 years later, I guess, you know, two months after I was born, we moved to Taiwan and we lived with my dad's parents and his grandmother. And they all spoke Taiwanese or Japanese because it was kind of like the common language, but my that was like the first time my mom learned Taiwanese was so that she could communicate with her husband's grandmother who only spoke Taiwanese. Mm. Uh, and then, and then, and then basically what happened to my mom happened to me where all the adults around me would speak Taiwanese, but nobody would teach the kids because it was like their secret code language. And, uh, that's kind of eventually how I figured out when they switch to Taiwanese, they're having serious talks just for grownups. And, Usually when people learn languages, they learn vocabulary or denotation first. And then, you know, those individual words kind of accumulate and then they finally get to like the emotional charge behind it. But, but, but I went the opposite way where I hear Taiwanese and think, is this a bad place for me to be right now? I, am I in trouble? It was definitely like a self-preservation 
thing for me. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'll just speak briefly about my Taiwanese experience. Uh, I, for me, it was a language that I first knew um, as a baby, as an infant, between the age of like zero and five or so, because uh, I would go back and forth between Taiwan and California uh, because my grandparents were taking care of me, and they spoke. Taiwanese as their first language, or the language that they spoke most fluently, and then they learned they were they grew up under the Japanese education system. So they they wrote, uh, they they can write and speak and listen and read in Japanese. Um, but you know we can get into this in the Taiwanese history section, I guess, of the podcast. But um, yeah, so basically Taiwanese, I always associated with an older generation. And then with a uh, similar to your experience, Emmy, like my parents would speak to each other in Taiwanese and usually maybe it's to discuss us or, um, and then for my grandparents, I would just say like, oh, it's time to eat, uh, you know, it's time to eat. Or it's like, uh, uh, I'm going to go out and play. Wakiki, you know, yeah. So stuff like that. So my, my Taiwanese is very limited because after the age of five, um, I, w- I stayed in the U.S. And from there, I just, I went through the American education system. And because of that, a lot of, I lost both Taiwanese and Mandarin. And this is something I've talked about with Dan. You might have heard on a previous podcast, but it's similar. It's kind of a, the inspiration for my short film, uh, Amar and Allen, and about this kind of, and something you write about as well as this kind of third culture kid's shame as if feeling like I should speak Taiwanese, I should speak Mandarin, I should, maybe I should even learn, pick up some Japanese as well. But uh, I think that's actually, I think you make a good point in your article about like, that's actually a fallacy. It's like, you shouldn't feel pressured into knowing these languages, you know. If you want to learn it, go for it, you know. If not, um, you know, don't feel like you have to. Um yeah, Dan, did you have any questions on follow up on that or any thoughts? Um, does your dad speak Japanese? He did. Um, he passed away um, oh. 16, 17 years ago. Yeah, by the time he didn't when he first went to Japan because his parents didn't teach him. Right. Um, I think he was too busy trying being the first in his family to learn in Mandarin. And then. Um, but everyone at the school, all the kids anyway, spoke Taiwanese at home and, and they'd get beaten at school. So, so for him, <laughs> Mandarin was like a self-preservation language. And then um, when he was done with his military service, his parents told him, go, go look for work in Japan. So, so he did that. And he, he said that the first month of being in Japan, all he ate was, was curry because that's all he could say was curry <laughs> rice. <laughs> and then, um, but by the time I was born, he, he had been living and working there for 15 years and um, he was just gifted with languages, I think. His, his favorite type of joke was like where you have to know two languages almost equally well to, to have like the right puns. Um, so that's, so that was, that was fun. And I think my parents decided to move to Taiwan, um, move, basically move back for my dad because my mom figured out he missed speaking in Taiwanese. So that was oh. definitely his preferred, his preferred language. Uh, but at home, since nobody liked Mandarin and like my mom didn't speak it and my grandparents didn't speak it, only my dad did. So he would only speak it outside. Um, when he had to and then at home you know there was a mix of Japanese and Taiwanese uh, and then at school I, my, my entire education has been in English so yeah that was kind of everyone just kind of had their language that they were responsible for so do you ever go back to Japan I did I I think I did a lot when I was younger and then from about um, maybe 12 or 13 through the rest of my teenage years, I, I didn't really go back to Japan a lot. And then, um, 
And when we when we went, it was usually to see my mom's side of the family. They they lived in Kobe. That's where she grew up. Okay. And then um, occasionally to Tokyo, which was where my dad had worked uh, before I was born. So have you been back as an adult or, I mean, prior to the pandemic or? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, um, I kind of went through a phase where I, I knew I wasn't, I knew I wasn't Taiwanese growing up or, or I believed I wasn't Taiwanese growing up because at the time, uh, Mandarin was definitely like number one, you know, if, if you didn't speak Mandarin well, you weren't Taiwanese. And um, this was this was during the uh, the martial law period, and so so I kind of grew up around that time, and I didn't speak Taiwanese. I had a Japanese passport only, and we spoke Japanese at home, so I didn't think I was Taiwanese. And then everyone called me Japanese and would tell me I'm Japanese, but then um, my Japanese wasn't that great either because I never I never studied it I just spoke it at home and um, as a kid like I don't we would go to Japan but I, I, haven't, I, don't, I don't know geography I don't know anything about Japan and then the older I got I, I had no idea what pop culture was you know in in Japan so other people were telling me or asking me stuff about Japan and I just I had no clue um, I've never I've never seen the uh, cherry blossoms in Japan, and I'm like almost 40 years old. Yeah, and <laughs> but Taiwanese people have gone. You know, they go every year if they could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I definitely, yeah, I definitely was like not in between cultures and not not knowing where I was. Um, you know, it, 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 in that mix, and then um, my education being American English. Uh, you know, like I went to university in the States and so then I'd go there and people were like, oh, your English is so good. Like how long have <laughs> you been here? And I go, I, I always spoke like this. And then um, n now, like I don't, like I don't think of myself as an American, but a lot of people would say that I'm American, uh, like almost as a compliment and I get really angry at that. <laughs> yeah. Take especially that. now, especially, especially now. now. Yeah, we're, 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 I mean, we're number one in coronavirus cases and deaths. And yeah. And deaths. And it's interesting. I, I think this idea of, of language and identity is very, I don't know if it's, it just seems very closely tied. And it, I, I'm, I wonder about this connection of identity and, and language and like, is it, because yeah, you speak, you grew. Like connection to family members. Well, yeah. So, well, I when I'm th I'm thinking about this idea of language and identity. So, like, if you speak perfect English, you know, whatever perfect means, but you speak, you know, your your English is American accented, and you went to you were educated in American English. So then people assume that you're American, and I think you know that's basically an assumption based on you know. Uh, frequency, right? The people that most people interact with that speak American English are American, right? Or grew up in America. But uh, it's interesting. I think this idea of maybe it's arbitrary, this idea of like your language and identity, maybe they're connected, but they can also be in some ways, uh, I don't know, maybe separate. I don't know if that's the right word. I don't know if that makes sense. Like this idea uh, that, yeah. yeah. I don't know if this is exactly what you mean, but I watched an interview uh, with Jimmy O Yang uh, from like Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw his. Uh, I went to his show in the Ice House. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, well, I I discovered him. I I don't watch anything new, and um, so I didn't know he was in. Like, I haven't watched Crazy Rich Asians. I, I think I might be the only Asian who hasn't <laughs> watched that. And yeah. no he, judgment. <laughs> He uh, gave an interview where, um, I don't know, something, something about how he was saying he grew up in Hong Kong for like, you know, until he was 10 or something and then moved to the States. And, and so the whole like identity shift for him and um, that kind of led me to looking up some of his other stuff that he talks about. And he, he once said that um, 
in Silicon Valley, he liked he liked being the Chinese person with a Chinese accent <laughs> because that's kind of stigmatized. Like Asian, like Hispanics, like it's very it's very cool for Hispanic Hispanic actors to be speaking with very thick uh, accents, um, but then it's not for Asians. So he kind of wanted to take that away and kind of normalize that some without making it seem like just because you speak with an Asian accent means you're stupid or mm. you don't understand well. So, um, and it's true, like, I I don't know about you guys, I can't speak with a Chinese accent even if I wanted to. Yeah. No, I, I can't do it. <laughs> I, can, I, mean, I, can, I can do it from copying him on the show. Right. It would sound, I think I could do it, but it would just sound like, bad like a stereotype of a stereotype yeah <laughs> like a copy of a copy so yeah i mean because i did some acting before and and yeah it's it's and it's it's called upon and i think you know dan whose wife is an actress or actor is an actor uh she could probably speak about like yeah sometimes when you go into auditions or certain roles there's like when they're looking for asian they're also sometimes they're looking for someone who speaks an Asian accent, which is like kind of ridiculous because Asian is such a wide, you know, such a a big diaspora. So like, we, but people yeah. just assume speak oh, Asian? just speak Asian, yeah, yeah. And it's just it's a very it's racist to be honest. Yeah, just to ask someone to speak Asian. Yeah, uh, so it kind of happens even in Asian communities, I think, because um, you know, for example, I, I hope. I hope the person I'm telling this story about never hears this. Uh, as a as a thank you gift for for somebody um, who likes Japanese food, I I wanted to make like pickled ginger um, for her, but it, I didn't know how. So I was asking my mom, who is culturally Japanese and, and knows how to do that. And I guess I kept asking questions, but wasn't doing anything. So my mom just took over and she's like, "You're gonna mess it up anyway." And and so she made it and you know I gave it to I gave it to my friend and my friend kind of knows my family background some. Yeah. So at first she tastes it and she's like, oh this is so great. This is this is real ginger that came from a Japanese kitchen. And I didn't say anything. She goes, wait, 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 no, well, but she's okay, so like I guess Asian kitchen. And <laughs> and when I told my mom, she was kind of like, what the I just got downgraded to like generic Asian. <laughs> <laughs> What was she expecting Japanese, like authentic Japanese or? Um, well, was she wasn't she... expecting anything because it was a surprise. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. But and, she knew your background, uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so, so that kind of sparked a, a, a talk between my mom and me where she was kind of like, why do you tell people, like, why do you tell people, why do you go into such detail? She's like, just tell everybody I'm Japanese. And, um, but that would just totally erase her life story. Like it would erase her parents' story of being in Taiwan um, or being originally Taiwanese and then going over to mainland Japan. You know, at the time it was mainland um, Japan. So, uh, so anyway, that that was kind of like, no, it's it's worth. So when you talk about connection, it's kind of like it's worth, um, it's worth peeling apart the layers so that you get an accurate view of history and, and, and an accurate perspective instead of just, um, you know, kind of like, I guess all the Asian Americans, now they're American. So like, they've just completely lost touch with their heritage. And, and, and that leads to not knowing what your identity is. I think if, if I were to talk to my mom about something like that, I think she would probably have the same reaction as your mom. And it might be that it's just a very Japanese thing to not pry. You, know, you just like, it's like this Japanese thing. Everything's so ambiguous in Japan, right? If you read the books, um, I talked, I remember talking to some guys and they said, oh, we love reading um, American books that are translated to English or translated to Japanese because there's so much detail. Whereas Japanese books leave a lot about um, reading between the lines. So it's contextualized because you don't want to like, pry too much into someone else's life and you don't want to give too much of your life to somebody else that's that might just be a stranger or not a stranger but like a friend but not like a super close friend does that yeah that, yeah that's... and and also i think too she doesn't want to correct people right so yeah. 
um, like I don't know about your mom, but like for example, um, you know, my mom's death in one year, but she would never tell anybody. So kind of like yeah. what you were saying, like she's not going to give that private detail about her life. But then people ask her questions, and because she's Japanese, she'll just agree. Yeah. And and she won't correct them, even if um, even if she is hearing out of her good ear, and they're saying something that's wrong because she already agreed to something incorrect earlier. She's not. She's still not going to correct them. Yeah. You know. Okay. So so, I, so basically, I like my whole life, um, I've kind of just been like her bodyguard. And, you know, it's like, especially in Taiwan and, and her being here as a foreigner, it was like, um, she's like, she's like, like her alien spaceship crashed and she has no way to get back. And so, <laughs> so, I, so I have to make sure she's going to be okay. And like her species will survive, <laughs> which is me. <laughs> yeah. I, I think going back to this idea of preservation, um, before we get into uh, the main topic of our, this podcast, which is the Taiwanese language, um, let's kind of like, uh, we got a little bit about your early history, about um, your background, um, your mom growing up uh, in Japan, and you moving here, uh, moving to Taiwan at two months old. Uh, what got you interested in your current MFA program, Historical Preservation in Archeo Architecture? And then, I guess, your self-proclaimed polymath, and how did this... <laughs> How did this connect to like our topic today? So yeah, maybe just a little bit about your background moving from your childhood uh, into adult as far as like your current studies, yeah. Basically, I, I like everything and, and I'm into everything. And so um, w when I first started out in college, like I, I was majoring in um, psychology and anthropology, it was like together, and then a separate English lit. And what I should have done looking back was um, majored in history maybe, because I've always liked history. And uh, throughout my 20s, I was just kind of wandering around and learning a lot of different things. And um, I, on a whim, several years ago, I, I decided I was gonna get into ceramics. I, I don't know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And part of that involved cleaning out somebody's, somebody else's studio. And it was, that was how I found a course catalog. It took kind of going into ceramics and then finding uh, a program, you know, design, you know, that described all the things that I liked, like history and architecture and art and art history, um, engineering. And and I'm kind of reading it for the first time. I'm like, it's all the things I like together. So, so that's that's kind of how I started on that. And when I started two years ago, it was definitely I thought it was going to be almost all about architecture. But then about a year and a half into it, I realized well, it's actually really more about cultural preservation. And um, because of I guess my complicated background in in multicultural living, it it just kind of went that way gotcha and, and then as far as the your Taiwanese language ability it sounds that you grew up speaking uh, Japanese at home and then you I guess you don't like Chinese or <laughs> you, you or you use basically Chinese is something that you you learn as a necessity it, it, please correct me if I'm wrong I don't want to impose at all because I, I think we have similar nature so we might butt heads in this interview a little bit, but I just wanted to l let you know. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's because we have similar natures and I find empathy in your story. And, I, and you know, so please don't take it the wrong way. <laughs> um, no, I have it. It's, um, yeah, I, I have a pretty disagreeable nature. And so living in a place where people love Taiwan and do I love it? No, not really. Um, because my experience hasn't been the same as everybody else. And a lot of a lot of foreigners come to Taiwan. And they say, oh, "Taiwanese people are so friendly." Well, they weren't that friendly to foreigners when I was growing up, especially if you weren't the right kind of foreigners. So, if you weren't a Caucasian, if you weren't American, um, and especially if you were Japanese, because this is really during the martial law period when the KMT was, you know, that there was this big KMT narrative that um, Japanese people were bad, and the Taiwanese people who sided with the Japanese were traitors. And so I kind of got lumped into that group. 
and or my family did anyway. And as part of the reason why I didn't go to a Chinese public school because um, I, I grew up in the same neighborhood that my dad did. So he took me to his old elementary school to sign me up for school. And they said, we don't, we don't let foreigners in. And um, he's like, what do you mean? You, you, have a, you have a white American missionary kid in that class. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they're like, no, no, no. Our, um, our like, uh, student form, um, like student profile form, it, it only has three squares for a name, but like Japanese names, when they get like not translated, but like the, the kanji for it is usually four names or four characters. So like there's, so there's no room. We can't fit you in there. Like it wasn't even, I don't think it was a real reason either. I think it was just, that's bullshit. A convenient, yeah, it was just a convenient one. And then my dad was kind of like, I didn't ever enjoy being in school, um, in Mandarin anyway. And so, so never mind. And so that's kind of why I, you know, didn't ever go to Taiwanese school. And so when I meet the typical Taiwanese person who has gone through the public school system, I like, we have completely different experiences of what school was like in Taiwan. Mm. Uh, and then, and then, and then there's also a Japanese school and kind of a similar reason. Um, I could have gotten into the Japanese school, no problem, but there were so few people that the grades ran out by middle school and every every Japanese parent um, in Taiwan faces this dilemma for their kids is what are they gonna do about their kids high school education and a lot of them will send their kids to Japan because um, Japan has a strong returnee stu uh, returnee uh, culture where they're very accepting of kids who grew up outside of Japan and then like came back like repatriated. So they have schools for kids like that. Um, but it's just a lot of work to move your family across country just for a kid's education for a few years. And also my parents didn't feel they were Japanese. So they weren't, so that wasn't really like a convenient option. And that's how I ended up at an American school. And what, what's your journey for uh, Taiwanese? Uh, as far as the main topic of this podcast, which we are getting to now, Taiwanese, yay, Hokkien language, <laughs> finally, Thai market, Esther, Thai market, uh, what is it, where are we at, thank you, wow, it's so cool, I've never had it, like an intern in the, but sorry, I, I mean, I shouldn't call any orders to your intern, that's your intern, so Emmy, please let her know she can mark this time, <laughs> as far as we're switching over to the main topic of Taiwanese, yay, so Taiwanese, is also known as uh, Daigi, is a variant of the Hokkien language from the Hoklo people from southern uh, Mingyue or uh, Fujian province. And basically, my understanding uh, is that the you know the the southern Fujianese people, uh, the Hok, uh, the the Hokkien, they were very intrepid, uh, seafaring people. And they traveled throughout Southeast Asia. So there's variants of the Hokkien language in Malaysia, uh, you know, Singapore. Yeah, I was in Singapore one time. Where I was like, whoa, they're speaking Taiwanese. But that's me being very Taiwanese centric. No, they're actually speaking Singapore. Uh, they're speaking Singaporean variant of Hokkien. Um, so uh, before we get into that, I'm curious about your journey into Taiwanese. How did you, you know, I know that your family spoke it with each other. Um, your mom didn't really speak it, but she learned it as an adult. How about yourself? What's your, what's your I guess, your relationship with Taiwanese? Uh, you make it sound like I'm fluent in Taiwanese now, which I'm, I'm not. Uh, I think over the years, you, you can't help but absorb a few things. So listening comprehension gets better all the time. Um, speaking, I guess I can quit. So, and I got the first like emotional part already. So someone can get a very long opinion about something. And then at the very end, I have a very appropriate emphatic response in agreement or something, right? Um, I would say 10 years ago, I was, I was in a, I was in like a Taiwanese um, uh, political science, civic leadership program. And, and that's, the whole program 
was basically conducted in Taiwanese, but I didn't know that when I got into it. And so I, it was, uh, it was sink or swim. And I'm, I'm kind of insecure about my Taiwanese now because since it was mostly middle-aged men in that program, and also I heard it a lot from my dad and my granddad, and they're like always fighting about stuff. Or they weren't fighting, but they were just like having very heated discussions. So I, I wonder if when I speak Taiwanese, I sound most like a middle-aged Taiwanese man. <laughs> And you're and you're just you're just trying to order coffee, but you're you know you're coming off like your dad. You know it's it's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm making like you know middle aged man grunting noises. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my family, um, my 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 mom is from Zhanghua, and my father's from Lugang or Lokang in in Hokkien, and um, they actually speak a different. They speak. They have an accent. Uh, they they are my particularly my dad's family. Uh, in the Lukong era, they have an accented uh, form of Taiwanese. Um, as far as like, so because of that kind of, uh, I guess that event, that meeting, that got you more like uh, interested in studying the language? Are you studying it now or are you just kind of picking it piecemeal here and there? Uh, yeah, I'm not really studying it. But one good thing about that was halfway through the program, my grandmother in Japan died. And on her deathbed, basically, I think she was reverting back to Taiwanese, which was her original, uh, original first language, right? Like she, she and I only spoke in Japanese, uh, but I guess, yeah, towards the end, um, she was speaking in Taiwanese. And so if it hadn't been for that program, I wouldn't have understood her as she was dying. Oh. And yeah, and, and actually that, that's very, um, that's kind of a sad memory. And that's kind of why I don't want to watch your film either. <laughs> I'm uh, sure it's a great film, but like I think five minutes in, I would start crying and not stop the whole way through. How dare you? You we you're weak. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I understand. I mean, there's some people who don't watch horror movies and stuff like that. So I guess if it triggers anything, I, I wouldn't want to cause suffering, you know. But I think when you eventually, if you do eventually watch it, I think you might connect with it. But yeah, if it triggers trauma, then yeah, you, I guess that's your choice. Yeah, and I respect that. Uh, I don't think it's so much trauma. Um, I have had language trauma, but I don't think that one's it. I think that's just a lack of emotional availability. <laughs> hmm. Dan, how do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> how do I feel? Silence. Sorry, I. Sorry, I just I. I whenever so if you notice from our podcast whenever i feel awkward i divert to dan it's one of my tactics and i'm just being very open <laughs> about that right now so dan if, if i ever divert to you please know that's that's not out of um spite it's out of insecurity so anyways uh moving on yeah so as far as like taiwanese uh let's let's get a little bit about some of the topics that you brought up in your your upcoming article which may be, may be released at the time of this podcast, you, go, you talk about this idea of language, dialect, and accent and the differentiation between the two. I think most people who are not linguists or, or bilingual or trilingual or whatever, I, I don't think they're, they quite understand the difference, even though you know, I think for the three of us here, since we all have multicultural backgrounds, we have an understanding of kind of the nuances and differences, but... Do you mind, like, you know, for our listeners, kind of like your take on the difference between those three three things? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of disagreement, I guess, and um, I would say my definition of it, just so that people can't say I'm working off of a different um, understanding than than them. It, a language is a group of dialects. And um, any country that you go to now, you, for example, you think of Spain and there's just Spanish, but, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds of Spanish, right? And depending on where you go. And so that's, that's dialects. And then in, for Chinese, it's even, it, it covers an even bigger geographical area and um, there's even more people groups. And so, so each dialect kind of has its own way of saying things and occasionally like they'll use completely different words and phrases um, for, for everything and, or not everything, but enough things 
but they're the same language because their written form is the same. And then um, even within the same dialect, though, sometimes people will pronounce things a little bit differently. Like they might, um, they might have intonation that's at different places. They might stress different syllables. Uh, I, when I was in middle school, I, I had a had a teacher. Uh, she was from upstate New York, and she said when she did her teaching, her first teaching job in the South, everybody thought she was a bitch, because in the South, especially women, they always end their sentences going up, even though it's not a question. And if you watch the press secretaries that um, President Trump has had that were Southern women, whenever they give lists, they always kind of goes up and it's kind of sing-songing. But from upstate New York, she was always talking down. Like her, her, the ends of her sentences were always um, very downward tone. And so, so in in a Southern community, they were kind of like, why is this woman speaking in such a um, condescending way, oh. and, and and so so she didn't understand. But you know, when she explained it that way, it was kind of like, oh yeah, like every every country, every dialect will have um, accents like that, and and a lot of times people don't know that. So for example, if I'm in the states, um, I I kind of pick up accents with like whoever I'm speaking with. So if I'm in the north, I speak with a more northern accent. And then if I'm in the South, I'll speak with a more Southern accent. And so um, people kind of always say to me, oh, you don't have an accent. It's like, well, no, I do, but I have your accent. So to you, it seems like I don't have one. And which is because English is my first language, I can do things like that. Whereas like in Japanese or any of the, or Chinese, I, I can't do that as much. And again, like even in Chinese, like the three of us all speak different forms of Chinese probably, right? Um, we, we might not have, we might not call the same things, the same names, uh, but then, um, you know, maybe in English, like we're all pronouncing it the same way because we're all speaking the same English dialect and maybe with the same accent. Right. Yeah. Tangent. Taipei American. Yo, one time I called them to help to shoot a scene from Amma and Allen. And this, like, this speaking about condescending. So uh, this lady picked up, and and I was, or like, hey, I'm interested about shooting a scene. She's like, oh, no, you know, no, you know. I had sent an email. I, I didn't, and then um, I think I got her like, what did I do? I think I sent an email. I didn't get a response. So I followed up with a call, something to that effect. And basically, she was like, oh no, no, we have very important people here. Um, Oh wait! I, first of all, I didn't get the the call didn't go through. They they're like, sorry, we can't talk about that. Uh, just send an email. So that was step one. Step two, I sent the email, and then she emailed me back saying, oh, no, we have very important people here. We can't let, allow any sort of filming. And uh, you know, it just seemed a little bit uppity to me. I mean, the the tone in which she used her words, as if, you know, even though I was speaking English, you know, and uh, and I was writing in you know perfect English, whatever that means. So I don't know. I don't know if you get, get, sorry, sorry, I'm just basically, I'm trying to like, but then this is Taipei. I think this is Taipei. So it might not be your guys' school, you and Esther. So anyways. I don't think they're at school or from. What, what, what's that? I'm already, in, I'm already in hot water with them. <laughs> oh, yeah. If they I, actually listen to this podcast, if they listen to this podcast, that means we've made it and <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah, we made it. We made it, Dan. But the reason I bring that up is this kind of, these international schools, which are technically American schools, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's, it, you know, I, I can't help but feel a little bit of like American imperialism a little bit because as this feeling of, you know, white uh, world, uh, right? Like, oh, the, the moon is, is, is rounder in a different country or whatever. Esther, mark, mark this spot. James is going on a tangent. Please, I, I mean, Don't please. tell my ass. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Esther. I'm going to stop doing that. I apologize. Uh, no, sincerely, I, I'm going to stop doing that. I just think it's it's uh, very interesting. Anyways, sorry. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, because um, 
and Esther and I, I asked Esther this yesterday. Uh, it was part of a larger conversation about role models. And um, I, I was telling her lately, I, I see a big trend in business where a lot of female entrepreneurs are saying, um, this company is completely female owned and operated and um, everybody's a woman. And so, but, but that to me, I don't think that to me guarantees a superior product. Like I wouldn't say any women and ran the company. Um, and uh, that kind of morphed into, well, what if there are um, more female, non-Caucasian role models in general, because there, there, you know, isn't. And Esther and I kind of both agree when, when we were growing up in Taiwan, um, even more so for me, probably, uh, she's like 20 years younger than me. Um, like everything American was good. Everything Caucasian was good. And, um, now the tide has really turned where everything Japanese is good. And th there's definitely like a, um, and this is specific to Taiwan. Th there's definitely like the trendy role model race, I guess, <laughs> or race and, and culture. And, and now that I see a big interest in Taiwanese, um, there's also kind of like a, a restoration, like a like a re-glorification of of the Taiwanese language, the same way that you know Japanese people or Japanese culture went from um, the rulers to the traders to now like really popular, mm. and um, you know, and Americans went from not being here at all to having this you know the huge presence that they did. And then that, or that they had, and then they kind of never left. And so then they were like really glorified. And then now because of the whole coronavirus, it, it's gone the other way. Just <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of I Before the pandemic, I'm sure we were going the other way. <laughs> yeah, 2016. And, yeah. Yeah. And so Esther was saying, like, you know, in um, for her, it's kind of like the opposite, where as a young child, it didn't really matter to her whether or not there were non-Caucasian role models, um, especially like female role models. And um, now that she's in college and it's more of a thing, like now, now it's, um, you know, now it's bigger. So, but whereas a lot of people now are trying to target young girls now so that they have healthy non-Caucasian role models now. And, um, I feel like, I don't know, I was raised by men. So <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, that like the whole thing is kind of a non-issue to me. Mm. Yeah. And, and okay, so going back to Taiwanese, yeah. um, same thing, right? Like my image of Taiwanese as a language is, um, you know, men getting into very heated discussions through <laughs> over Taiwanese. And, when I when I brought this up, I, I was talking to somebody else. Um, uh, her her image of what's the what's the more like country dialect of Cantonese? So Toisan. Yeah, yeah, that one. Um, so for her, like she had a lot of aunties who were arguing in Toisan all the time. So so like her idea of Toisan is like you know um, a lot of middle aged women shouting in the background. <laughs> yeah, and so I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see now that there are so many people interested in Taiwanese, um, you know, what they're going to tell the next generation, I guess, about about what having the Taiwanese language in in your heritage means. Yeah, because I think. Um, oh yeah, just to qualify, um, if Taipei American School is listening, I do understand where you guys are coming from. And I know that you have to protect your very elite stu uh, students. And I think it's presumptuous to me to say that, oh, you should, you should just let me film. So I just want to qualify my statement. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you should have gone to art school because we have nobody famous there. Oh, really? Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, and you're in, uh, did, you, did you grow up in Taizong area or Taipei area? Or? I did, yeah. 
Taichung. Taichung. Okay, and and that in itself is also a little bit different linguistic linguistically as well, because the general idea uh, is that the further south you go, the more Taiwanese is spoken. It, it, am I correct in saying that? Uh, yes, because um, when the KMT government, they were the ones who brought Mandarin, which is a northern Chinese language or dialect. Um, before that, pretty much all the Chinese spoken in Taiwan was a, a southern Chinese of southern Chinese origin. Uh, so whether that's Hakka, um, Hokkien, um, the Hakka people, the Holo people. And I, China is kind of like Middle Earth. Everything and everyone has at least three to five names. And the they kind of move around a lot. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, no, Middle Earth, like Tolkien. Um, I can't get through those books because I get confused. They're super who's, dense, who's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just watch the movies. That's a very good, that's a very good so, edit I, of the books. I think yeah, so, someone uh, edited like the, all the movies into like one. You know, people do that. They edit like all the Star Wars into like one movie or all the stuff. Anyways, anyways, continue, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is tai Taiwan has um, a very strong tradition in Hokkien. And specifically, like the whole low people, which was there was just, like a lot of people coming to Taiwan from southern China, and um, even the food. Uh, when, for example, um, like Taiwan is was originally more of like a rice culture and not as much a flour culture. So like all the breads and stuff, it, it kind of came from northern China. And um, and I'm kind of skipping around a lot. But architecturally, too, before the KMT came and before the Japanese were here, the architecture in Taiwan was mostly like southern Chinese architecture. Mm. And then the Japanese colonial period, you know, really turned it into um, Meiji architecture. And then after that, the KMT started building and they brought with them more northern architecture. So, so Taiwan is really, I mean, we talk about America being a melting pot, but Taiwan is really a huge melting <laughs> pot. We just don't really know about it because people don't know that progression of events. And partly it's because a lot of things happen so close together um, and everything kind of just really melted together without any, like there's just big fusion. Yeah, I, I think for our listeners, it might, be, it might be good to kind of maybe historically look at, maybe on a very, we, we want, we, you know, it'd be, we don't want to do like a three hour podcast, but a very brief history of like talk, the linguistic uh, languages of Taiwan. Um, so I'll start it off, and then maybe Emmy you can fill, help help me out. But my understanding is that the first peoples of Taiwan were the Aboriginal people that crossed from supposedly from mainland China over a land bridge over the during the Ice Age. Um, and there is some kind of dispute as to, uh, as you mentioned in your article, uh, if the Micronesian Australasian people. Um, their origin is from Taiwan, or actually they from somewhere else, and they went, they came to Taiwan. But um, in my understanding, they are the first peoples of Taiwan, and they spoke their own dialects, which is much closer to the dialects or languages spoken in the Maori in New Zealand or some other Pacific islands as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, you want to take it from there as far as the linguistic history of Taiwan. One. A tile professor who um, is kind of like the keeper of a tile history. The way he explained it to me was um, that that Taiwan was the origin, I guess, of all these tribal languages. And his reasoning is um, linguists say the more guttural sounds there are in a language, the more original that language was. And then, and then as the language kind of progresses, um, you kind of lose that, and, and sound production moves to the front of the mouth. Mm. And so, so, so there's a count, like there's a chart of which language has however many guttural sounds. And a tile has people used to think um, like the more Polynesian groups had more guttural sounds, but but actually the a tile group 
has more guttural sounds. So, so by, so by that hypothesis, you know, it was the other way around. Oh. And, and so then, so then they migrated to, um, you know, not from China to Taiwan, but from Taiwan to China. And there are some folk tales that kind of allude to this, but because they're folk tales and you lose a lot of details, you, you know, kind of can't know for sure. Um, but then migratory patterns, there's a lot of back and forth, which is kind of my thing where we kind of think of migration as a one-way stop, mm. but or one way direction. But there's there's like in my family, you know, we're we're Taiwanese, Japanese, back to Taiwan. <laughs> and um, it, you know, so we're like third, fourth generation, I, I don't know, but originally. Uh, from my dad's side of the family, we came from uh, Guangdong. So, so I guess like that's why our family spoke Hokkien instead of Hakka. And uh, you know, and and so the Holo people they kind of went everywhere too. So they went from wherever they were settling in southern uh, China to uh, all the way to, like you said, Singapore, and and they took their language there too. And so that's why you can kind of go, you can speak Hokkien in all these different places. But what what makes Taiwanese Hokkien special is the amount of Japanese influence on Hokkien because of the colonial period. Japan also tried to go make colonies all over Southeast Asia, but they kind of either resisted or they lost wars with other imperial powers. And so the English or the French or, um, you know, they, they took over instead. And, and so in those places, there's more English influence on Hokkien. Mm. Yeah, so for example, um, oh, should we go into the quiz? Yeah, that, let's, that, let's that do it. Do you, have, do you have some work prepared? So Dan, um, Emmy w- suggested quizzing you to see if you can guess um, the <laughs> Japanese equivalent to the, wor- the Taiwanese words that she is speaking. Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah, Emmy, if you if you want if you would like to go into that section, yeah, go for it. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm a little nervous about this. Okay. Because I don't want to sound like a Taiwanese man. <laughs> uh, okay, Dan. Okay. Uchire obasan kya otobai ide tia rajio. What do you think that sentence is about? Wait, can you say that again? It was breaking up yeah. just a little bit. Well, and also, I think I think I was bad too. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, was breaking up. <laughs> well, obviously, I can get the borrowed words like "otobai" is motorcycle, "obachan" is grandmother, um, "radio" is obviously radio, but um, the other ones that are filling in, like the "can," "kochi no obachan." Auto by King, something blah blah blah. Oh, yeah, radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, in Taiwanese, oh James, uh, <laughs> did I say it well enough that that you, you I mean, could translate? I I mean, I uh, again, I want to qualify like my Taiwanese level. I'm not sure. I think your Taiwanese level sounds like it's a little bit bit better than mine, to be honest. Uh, my I'm still like learning as well. Um, shout out to Bite Size Taiwanese. Thank you for your your content. I'm learning from you guys. And um, also, yeah. I'm. And I'm glad I'm not the worst. I mean, I don't have to be the best. I just have to be better than the worst. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the worst. You're definitely not the worst. Very good job. <laughs> so, uh, kia otobai, just it kia means to ride a, a, a motorbike. Tia means to listen. Tia, which is sim, uh, I guess it's uh, in Mandarin, it's like ting, right? Um, and then uh, kia, so ride. Uh, so she's so this obasan, uh, this grandma, is riding a motorcycle, listening to the radio. Am, am I correct? Is that what you're going for? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and Ooh. Taiwanese. One point uh, for James. I'm gonna write it down example. myself. Yeah, one point, James. Yeah. Uh, who are you, who are you competing with? I'm a competitive Damn. person, Dan. <laughs> if you probably uh, have you seen our push hands one 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 episode we were pushing hands, but anyways, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the, the interesting thing about that is, for example, um, otobai. So in, in actual Japanese, it would be otobai. 
but mm. because Taiwanese, with its tonal inflection, um, has turned it to oto bai. And uh, in, I'm fairly certain, only in Taiwan would you call a motorcycle oto bai, because in the other places, um, like Singapore, Malaysia, maybe the Philippines, um, in those places, it was English-speaking influences that like brought the motorcycle there, so they would call it bike. Um, <laughs> cow, cow, and and um, so there's that. And then uh, same with radio. Um, it, when you when you're studying languages and you study how they develop, a big clue is tech because um, words for tech come from whoever brought that to that civilization. And in in Japanese, uh, you know, they learned radio from Europe and and Americans, and so so they just took radio, turned it into Japanese pronunciation, radio, mm. and then took that on. And then as far as obasan, um, in Japanese, yeah, like obasan, and it's like a grandmother, like an elderly woman, and it's it's fairly it's polite enough that you could call somebody obasang and it's like, like to their face, right? Like you yeah. could, yeah, you, you could talk to them and it's not rude or anything, but in Taiwan, um, it's, it's not something you would say to somebody to their face. <laughs> it's more like when you're talking about a stranger and it's not necessarily an elderly woman and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a respectful way to call somebody. So they just like, so some stranger, some strange, old woman who I don't know is obasan. And then that's kind of rude, right? So now in Taiwanese, there's more and more people saying um, obasan xiaojie, which is completely <laughs> <laughs> an oxymoron. You can't be an old and a young woman at the same time, but you would call somebody that you don't know xiaojie to their face. So so there's that progression. Or they say ama, right? Or ama. Yeah, they say ama. For, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. They If they're talking to somebody, who's um, and and that's really closer to the Japanese where yeah if you don't know somebody and she's a lot older than you would just call her grandma mm. yeah our mind and is is I guess Taiwan is Taiwanese Mandarin and really what we would use for both the uh, Nai Nai which is paternal grandma and then uh, Wai Po uh, which is the maternal grandma Ama is the term used in Taiwan for both you can use it for both sides um, but cool. Do you have any other sentences for Dan to uh, guess? <laughs> okay. Yeah, the second one. Um, that one I'm not so sure about. I was like, I'm not something Japanese or from Japan. I'm Japanese. I don't uh, know. What's the last word? What's uh, What in Japanese is pang? <laughs> pang is bread. But yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So James, do you, do you want to uh, translate for Dan? Yeah. So what? It was sorry. It was like what? What I will? Oh, what I love Japan. What I what what I Japan. So what means war, which means I. Um, Jia means to eat, and then Feng is like uh, is rice or or. Like I guess it's like fan, which is go like in Gohan, right? Han is I guess, but you wouldn't call Han, you know. Anyways, uh, but anyways, like fan is rice or bung, and then uh, yeah, pan is bread. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to eat rice. I want to eat bread. The interesting thing about bread is um, uh, a lot of people would say that. The Portuguese brought bread to Taiwan, um, and so some people would say, "Oh, so the Taiwanese word for bread is actually from Portuguese, mm. but also Japanese because it's pang, um, right?" I I kind of think it's more from Japanese, not Portuguese, because in Portuguese it's not pang, it's it's bao, like like p a with the tilde and and o. So there isn't that last n sound. Um, and, uh, for example, I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier about food cultures. Um, 
Taiwan or southern China is more rice based because you can harvest, you can grow and harvest rice more easily in the south, the, the weather, the climate's warmer. But northern China is more for wheat growing, and so is Japan. And so um, Taiwanese people probably didn't eat a lot of flour based foods until the Japanese brought bread over. And the Japanese brought bread over because they had. Um, a lot of European influences where that's kind of where they were have, like my mom grew up in Kobe and they had a lot of really good German bakeries there. So she grew up in Japan eating toast for breakfast, whereas like all her Japanese classmates were eating like a traditional Japanese breakfast. Ah. Yeah. So that's, so that's where that comes from. Cause there are a lot of Taiwanese words that a lot of people would say, oh, they're, they're from Japan, but it's actually like, it's from some other country, like with the radio, it's from some other country and then came through Japanese into mm. Taiwanese. Or because Taiwan had been colonized before by European powers, you know, it came from, maybe it came straight from the European powers. That's so, a, yeah. so that's another, yeah. That's interesting, yeah, because it's kind of like, well, it'd be interesting to find out which came direct from the Dutch and the Portuguese or the Spanish, all three who have been in Taiwan versus those three which have also influenced the katakana english i guess is, is one way to refer to it uh, the, the the japanese loan words and then were transferred into the taiwanese language yeah that'd be interesting to figure out mm -hmm. which one which yeah, one and is uh, so a lot of Taiwanese people kind of forget that um koksinga um do you know what i'm talking about the yeah. the ming loyalist uh, um, Gong, yeah. Warrior. yeah he um so a lot of people think Taiwanese was only influenced by Japanese language during the colonial period, which was from 1895 to 1945. But way, way, way before that, in the 16th, 17th century, um, Koxinga basically made Taiwan his base of operations to fight against the Qing dynasty. <laughs> and and what people don't realize about Koxinga is he's half Japanese. Like he, his mother's Japanese. He was born in Japan. He lived in Japan. So he was, I don't know, seven or eight years old. Um, and, and he spoke Hokkien. And so, so that's really where, uh, Taiwan became a Hokkien speaking country, you know, with, with him and his army all bringing Hokkien over to Taiwan, the island, but he himself personally had a lot of influence from Japan. And I think his mother joined him in Taiwan later. Mm. Um, so, so his descendants, there are different branches. Um, you know, there's some in Taiwan, and then there's some in Japan, and there's some in China. Mm. And, and and that, you know, so that's, um, and then they kind of have different, uh, like their families is very interesting because linguistically, culturally, they're they're probably all very different from each other, even though they kind of all descended from the same man. And he he came to Taiwan to kick out the Dutch. Or like uh, in, uh... He, yeah, um, and and he, you know, like later he, as he was kicking out the Dutch, he also like took their wives too, like oh. concubines, <laughs> um, yeah, or, or their daughters, or yeah, yeah. Like, he's very multicultural. Um, he, <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he. I think his main goal. I uh, whenever I watch Game of Thrones, I kind of think, oh, people, people think, oh, it's such a new story or whatever. But it happened in China because exactly the same way there are all these different people groups in China trying to, you know, rule over uh, China and like united and, and, and everything. And so um, Koxinga, he was uh, from the Ming dynasty and there's like the up and coming Qing dynasty that he's trying to kick out. But in order to do that su successfully, he had to come to Taiwan and kind of build his army. but the Dutch army was already here. So he had to kick them out first, then go um, back to China to kick out the, the Qing dynasty. Mm. So it's kind of like Game of Thrones, right? Like they're, they're trying to, they're trying to win the war of five kings, but then they need to kick out the White Walkers first. Like there, there's just all this drama. And he needs help life. from the wildlings, which are the aboriginals, right? I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, so we got to Koxing and then from there, um, yeah, so basically Taiwan was a very Hokkien speaking uh, country uh, from until the end of the Qing Dynasty, if I'm correct. 
And then what happened? Uh, what happened? I guess between Japan and the Qing Dynasty. Could you want to touch on that real brief? Um. Uh... Japan was getting greedy and wanted to take over. They already took over Manchuria. Uh, and I, I would say go watch The Last Emperor. Um, yeah. By, uh, yeah, so a classic movie. For the Lucci, they yeah. do kind of skip a lot of things. Yeah. Um, but, but watching that movie kind of sets up the whole um, – like modern backstory to what happened between Taiwan, Japan, and China. Mm. And then, so Taiwan became under uh, Japanese colonial rule, as you mentioned, until from 1895 to 1945, the end of World War II. Um, yeah, and that's because the Qing Dynasty lost to Japan. So in their treaty, they said, "Yeah, you can you can have Taiwan," mm. and um, all these, all these countries, even modern day, modern day countries, they want Taiwan because it was really rich in natural resources. They had a lot of really good lumber. And Japan, um, up until that point, their main architecture, like their main um, way of building, was through carpentry. Like that was their preferred building material. So Taiwan had a lot of really good trees, and and they wanted they wanted the lumber from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, that sparked a lot of um, disputes and, I mean, some really ugly battles between the indigenous tribes and Japan. So there was all that skirmish happening, too. And even the, uh, the indigenous tribes, they were also learning a lot of Japanese at the same time. I don't know enough about indigenous languages now to be able to... Um, say what words there were, you know, that came from the Japanese the way Hokkien did, because Hokkien was just so, uh, it was the main language. It was like everybody spoke Hokkien. So it was really more like the Japanese language was the minority when it took over. And okay, so in my article, I kind of talk about um, at what point does a dialect become a language? And a lot of linguists would say, oh, it's just the dialect. There's really no difference, except the dialect with the biggest army and can beat every other dialect in the submission is the language. <laughs> so in, in all, you know, so, so that's kind of how um, a lot of European countries, what we think of now as European countries with their language is actually the language of the capital city because it was the biggest city, it had probably the biggest army. Um, and that's exactly kind of what happened in Taiwan too, where every time there are these big wars and um, culture wars, whichever culture won was the one that dictated what everybody else spoke. Cool, Dan, did you have any questions? I've been, I've been asking for, uh, for a minute. Uh, yeah, did you have anything you wanted to add? I want to go backwards and talk about the architecture. Is there some place in Taiwan that has like, um, where you can see examples of Southern Chinese architecture, Japanese architecture, and Northern Chinese architecture, like in a very close proximity? Uh, yes and no. Um, in some cases, they're kind of all the same building and you kind of have to really know what you're looking for to be able to tell this part is southern, this part is northern, this part is Japanese. Uh, another reason why you can't really see it is because historic preservation in Taiwan hasn't really been that great. And so as people were restoring things, they were restoring them to kind of like the wrong era. Uh, and and they're kind of not keeping things the way they should have been kept, I guess, in my opinion to be able to delineate kind of like what you're saying. This right. is clearly Southern, this is clearly Northern, this is clearly Japanese. Okay. Mm. And then as far as like um, your Japanese concerned, since you're, it's mostly um, talking with your mom at home, do you have more of a, like a Kobe accent, like a, a Western accent versus the, the Easterner? <laughs> well, I don't uh, because by the time I was born, my 
mom had lived in Tokyo long enough. And um, she, I think she wanted to become like a radio announcer or something. So she learned the very like standardized city, uh, okay. city Japanese. So, so that dial, so that's another dialect, right? There's definitely like country dialects in Japan. Yeah. And um, people from big cities will go to like these small fishing villages and not understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So every country is really the same. <laughs> Right. Like, Dan, what, what does, what, um, I guess, what accent does your mom have as far as Japanese? Oh, uh, she's, oh, well, she's from the east, east side, so she's from Yokohama. Hmm. So there's not much of a Yokohama kind of accent, except for uh, the only one I got from the locals when I went to Japan is like, I guess at the end of like a verb, or Yokohama people say chow, tape chow, ne chow, hmm. no, nomu. Nonja. It's like you're gonna drink it. <laughs> drink. It's like a. Oh, I, I thought that was a verb conjugation because I would say that. Tabicha. No. Oh, tabicha. Tabicha. Not rather than tabicha. It's like tabicha. It's like go eat it. Uh, or, it's like tabeta. It's like tabicha. I'm gonna eat it. Oh, I see. Tabetu. Um, yeah, my cousins they definitely have Kansai accents <laughs> and and they went to different schools so they have i mean and even in the same generation um you know siblings and they have different uh basically like my uncle says they have different languages <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's more of a western kind of thing because when you go farther north like akita i don't in hokkaido i don't think they have much of a, a different like in compared to like Tokyo and stuff, I don't know. Not not from what I could tell. Yeah, I, I wish I, I wish I knew more Japanese uh, than I do because for a long time I was kind of speaking an older Japanese. I don't know if this is true for you because my mom had left Japan, right? So her her language didn't really change, right? Um, as it as it kind of progressed. So whatever I learned was from her. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, like now, <laughs> right. 40 years ago. And so, so there's like a time capsule almost in, in languages. Yeah, I think that's very true because I have cousins who grew up in Germany and they speak Cantonese, but then for whatever reason, the youngest cousin, his Cantonese is the best and he knows all the the, the current slang. So my, my half-sister who grew up in Hong Kong, she's like, I'm impressed with Stanley because his his Cantonese is really good, and he knows all the like the uh, current slang and all that stuff. So it's very interesting. But I know that his sisters aren't necessarily the same way. Mm. Yeah, because I know. Yeah, it, uh, and speaking of slang, um, do you mind if I if I go into go into my my tirade um, about Taiwanese and how sure. um, they took a lot of loan words from Japanese, and then it kind of got to the point where uh, Taiwanese, like within the Taiwanese language, they were putting Japanese words together. And so coming up with new words, new Taiwanese words. But because the words individually came from Japan or Japanese, they think they're, they think they're speaking Japanese, but they're actually not. <laughs> and uh, one, one huge example of this and First, I need to disclaimer, Bite Size Taiwanese, I love them. Their, their curriculum is great. Everybody should just go and buy their worksheets, get the full experience. They're great. Uh, one of their episodes, they talk about atama konkuri. But first of all, Dan, do you know what atama konkuri means from your Japanese knowledge? I don't know what konkuri means. Uh -huh. Atama is head, but konkuri, I have no idea. Do you, uh, Dan. Uh, do you know what concrete means? No. Concrete. That doesn't exist in, in my vocabulary. Okay. So you can keep telling me in different ways and like slower, Con faster. <laughs> I'm still like not going to get it. All right. Min minus one point, James. Damn it. I'm, I'm back to zero. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, Emmy, please explain. Yeah, Atama Konkuri is Taiwanese for uh, atama, head, and then konkuri is short for
for konkurito, which is concrete uh, oh. in Japanese. So it's kind of like you have a you have a skull full of cement or it's a skull full of concrete, and, yeah. and it's hard, right? So so it's like it's like a compound word for um, stubborn or obstinate and like nothing gets in kind of thing. Okay. And can't learn new things. Uh, and and so Taiwanese people think it's Japanese, and what they'll do is I mean it's almost it's almost farcical because they'll go to Japan. And, and now that it's like super popular for Chinese people to go to Japan or it has been for a while, they're admiring all these Japanese things and ways and and then like, cause they have an inferiority complex or something. They're like, oh, I could never do that because I'm atama konkuri. And Japanese people are like, what? That, kind of like with you just now, they're like, that's not in my vocabulary. It doesn't exist. <laughs> and yeah. I got the first part. I don't know what the second thing is. Or I don't know what the whole thing is. And, uh, Concrete, concrete wasn't imported into Japan until 1870, and so if we're talking about classical Japanese language. That's like way, way before that, like like Edo period, you know, Japanese. Um, 1870 is still very modern, and then um, Portland cement wasn't manufactured in Japan until 1875, which is the same year as Japan uh, as as the U.S. And so it's definitely a very modern building material. And up until that time, and even now, the preferred building material for Japan is, uh, in, or in Japanese architecture, is um, is wood, is timber. And it's only like, it's only like very, you know, considerably like in the long history of architecture recently with um, like Tadao Ando, where they make like these brutalist uh, concrete buildings that, that it's like finally concrete is established as a Japanese building material product, whatever. Uh, but anyway, because what I'm trying to say is because it's a recent thing, it couldn't have come into Taiwan and then in 50 years disappeared. And then now it's like coming up again in Taiwanese or like it's, it's like being reinserted back into the Japanese language. It, because this is my second point. Linguistically, it takes a really long time for phrases to disappear. Um, it's not like uh, I don't know. It's not like there was a gap and then it like bifurcated. It was more like you have two parallel universe situation where Japanese, like in the Japanese parallel universe, atama konkuri never ever existed. <laughs> and then it's only in in the Taiwan. Uh, or Taiwanese understanding of Japanese that like it came up and then and then it like continued. But linguistically, um, the fact that it takes a really long time for phrases to disappear is how linguists can figure out ancient dead languages. So like um, like we all know Latin as a is a dead language, but people speak Latin and we're kind of like, how is that possible? Like how would you know what? Latin sounded like originally. And that's because over the long course of language, there are all these clues that are left behind, kind of like um, breadcrumbs, right? Like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs. Mm. And in Taiwanese, that's like that's how we can figure out um, Taiwanese or Taiyi came from the whole low people however many centuries ago, and that Coxing probably spoke it too. Like, the, like, it's just, you can trace it back. And so like um, linguists, like for example, uh, for Latin, they take a lot of romance languages now and they figure out, well, how come all these different lang modern day languages have the same word for something? Oh, so that must've been, so they kind of like reverse engineer it and they go, okay, so that must've been the original Latin pronunciation. Mm. And you can't do that with a phrase like atama konkuri. <laughs> so, so that's you know it, like there's too short a history for that, and and I guess the final thing is um, like concrete. Yeah, like when I say concrete, and Dan doesn't know what that means, and then um, immediately James goes, okay, okay, concrete to. Like both Japanese and Chinese don't have final consonants. Like it's a it's a. Do you know what I mean? Like the language yeah. that you don't really end in a. The letter yeah. B or T or whatever. Um, I guess there's so, the N sound in Japanese. Just the N, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but there are there are other ones that are more prominent. Right. And so so when they take languages, when they take words from other languages that do have final consonants, the Japanese tend to over overdo it and the Chinese tends to underdo it. So so like concrete becomes konkurito in Japanese, but then in Chinese it's konkuri. Mm. Like, do you see that difference with the over yeah. and under doing? Um, it's the same thing like with chocolate. In Japanese, it's chokoreto, but in Chinese, it's chokori. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's so, that's, so, so there's that. So that I would say is an actual like, you know, splitting and and, and bifurcation of of culturally or like linguistically making that that separation. And so the fact that in for atama konkuri, it's it's atama konkuri and not dito. Uh, that, like that's kind of what tells me, okay, that's original to Taiwanese mm. and not something that came from Japanese. And yes, this is the hill I'm going to die on. Yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, it's it's interesting how. So then you're saying that it's a indig it, well, I guess indigenous in the sense that it's native to Taiwanese speakers. Yeah, like it's original, like they yeah. came up with it. That's kind of cool. And, but yeah, so like, so if people who, I guess, you know, if, if we were talking about Taiwanese people using that phrase in Japan, thinking it's a Japanese word, um, you know for sure that it's not original Hokkien because they wouldn't go to Singapore or Malaysia and say Atama <laughs> Hokkien and expect them to understand. Yeah. Um, I, have, uh, I have a few words to test. Uh, let me see. I, I I just I I might be butchering it, but ketchup. Do you guys know what that means? Ketchup. 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 <laughs> yeah, ketchup. Uh, so gay, I guess, is like I don't know which Hokkien it is. I I learned it from a YouTube video from someone who doesn't speak Hokkien natively either. So I'm like, it's like the telephone. So I'm, but gay means like fish. Jap means uh like sauce. So fish sauce. And then uh. Oh. And eventually, it came from Hokkien cuisine, but I think they, I think the Hokkien, they, it was something about there's a connection to Vietnam somewhere, but there's Hokkien in Vietnam as well, a, a Hokkien, the Hoklo people in Vietnam as well, and my understanding is like fish sauce, uh, eventually became ketchup after you know, the the British and the Americans added tomato to it, so. That's, I just I find that interesting. So yeah, for any like white nationalists listening, like whenever you eat fries with ketchup, just know that the, the origin of ketchup is from from Asia. So so stop hating, please. Yeah. Asian sauce. <laughs> <Sounds really bad. laughs> um, okay. So my 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 dad and my dad's generation would uh, my mom's generation, my dad's generation, we have a great aunt. She's still surviving and you know, love her. Uh, she grew up in She's one. She she grew up in the Japanese um, uh, colonial period. She's in her nineties now, and they would always call her Ginko San. Does that does that sound like anything to you guys? Ginko San. Bank. Yeah, they call her Miss Bank. <laughs> she have a lot of money. Was she was she the relative everybody went to for for I, money? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, it's kind of. She she used to work at a bank. So it's really interesting because a lot of, um, I, I don't know if it's the same for you, Emmy, uh, but a lot of people in my dad and mom's generation, they had Japanese nicknames or their, or their, their parents, my grandparents, they had Japanese names for each other. So like, um, like, you know, like one name I've heard or is like, you know, Kim Chan, you know, or something like that, or like something like, uh, you know, so the, the, basically these, um, yeah, they had Japanese nicknames. I, I just found that so fascinating. I think that's really important. I think that's why I think the work you're doing is very important because finding that kind of uh, Japanese heritage in history kind of explains a lot of present day things that like, oh, so that's where that kind of came from. Or that's why my grandparents spoke Japanese and why my parents have an affinity for Japanese culture. Um, that, yeah, I find it. I think that's that's why the work is interesting. Um, so we're we're running at ninety minutes now. Uh, I think uh, what I think we should uh, 
wrap it up with a few like the last questions. Um, is there anything that you personally want to go over that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, well, not just bite size timings, but also Japanese by chunking because we kind of spent some time talking about what Japanese or Taiwanese is or isn't yeah. and how they're different from each other. So definitely if you want to learn true Taiwanese, go to bite size Taiwanese. If you want to learn true Japanese, go to Japanese by chunking. Yeah. And also I just realized, um, I think I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for what I just said about <laughs> Taiwanese, the atama konkuri. Like the Japanese people do it too. Like it's important to <laughs> understand like, um, like every language borrows from another language and then they like, they make it their own. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, it's, it's not like any language, any one language is inferior. And I'm kind of worried that people are going to think, I think Taiwanese is inferior because that's not what I think. Yeah. And that's actually kind of, uh, something Taiwanese has had to fight against, you know, through many different iterations in Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan. I mean, I know for Taiwan, it's been suppressed uh, at least in two major uh, government-backed uh, campaigns. Once under the Japanese, where you weren't allowed to speak Taiwanese in schools, and also when the KMT, the Kuomintang, the Chinese Nationalist Party led by Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, uh, when he came in 1947, yeah, 1940, after he lost the war to Mao Zedong, um, his party also had a violent suppression of of the, the native the people living in Taiwan, um, and that's a whole another podcast uh, talking about the T two eight incident, which was um, I think wasn't wasn't well known until I think Ho Xiaoxian made the film City of Sadness and kind of touched on that period of time of the the white terror period in Taiwan, and then um, but yeah they're basically you would get a fine if you spoke Taiwanese at school. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, yeah, the, the transition from Taiwanese suppression to now this kind of, this now, like the young people are kind of, there's this Taiwanese nationalism. Do you feel that in Taiwan, maybe? Yes, because, uh, and I think I would say this has a lot of credit to the Japanese um, I get a lot of criticism for not being judgmental enough when I'm talking about history, which as a historian, neutrality is actually a good thing. So we're explaining events and then consequences and unintended consequences. And sometimes that takes decades or centuries to kind of like play out, right? And um, definitely the Taiwanese independence movement, the people who are the original activists they would never have done that if they weren't really educated. And they were really educated because of the Japanese mandating, you know, uh, making education mandatory. And if they were promising, kind of sending them to Japanese universities too. And, and so a lot of the original freedom fighters, uh, when they were in exile because of the KMT and they couldn't come back for political dissension, once they could come back to Taiwan, on, they they're the ones who like they're in their 80s and 90s um you know they spoke Taiwanese and Japanese equally well like they to them and for their identity linguistically is definitely Taiwanese and Japanese um but because they knew Japanese was imposed upon them is why they're really focused on speaking Taiwanese and so when they do all these, like the program that I went to, um, they really stress learning Taiwanese. And, and that's really kind of what sparked um, the more like government top-down focus for, uh, you know, understanding if, if you're Taiwanese and you want to build your Taiwanese identity, you have to learn Taiyi because that's your heritage language. And it's so it's slowly coming into the public school system and their textbooks now for people who are um, learning Taiwanese and it's in all the like public announcements. Like it used to just be in Mandarin, right? And then Mandarin and English. Mm. And now it's like Mandarin, English and Taiwanese. And I think Hakka is also becoming a big thing too. So that's, so that's definitely, there was like a, um, 
like the interest, I don't know which came first, like the interest in the language or because like you're interested in independence or you got really interested in the language. So that naturally leads you to independence. Mm. Like I, I can't really say for sure either way, but they're definitely linked. Mm. Cool. Um, Dan, do you have any questions before like we move on to the last section? I no, not at the moment. Okay. Um, any last, uh, yeah, because your article talks about Japanese and Taiwanese, any, any last connections that maybe we didn't get to discuss that maybe you want to touch on briefly about the kind of the transference between Japanese and Taiwanese and vice versa? I would say go learn languages. Um, if it's, if it's a heritage issue for you, learn a heritage language. Um, if it's just something that you're interested in, for whatever other reason, go go learn that. And um, definitely don't treat it as a foreign language though, because I, I think that's that's putting in a psychological block, um, you, you know, against mastery and, and ultimately identity. So for example, um, all these like productivity people, they talk about when you're building a habit, you don't want to tell yourself, I want to exercise three times a week, but I'm so bad at it because guess Guess what? Like, you've already decided you're going to be bad at exercising. But if you tell yourself, I'm the type of person who doesn't let three days go by without exercising, then you become that type of person. Mm -hmm. So applying that to language and thinking, I'm, I'm the type of person who um, might struggle in the language, but, but every day I'm getting better. And, you know, that's going to be so much more uh, of a psychological boost for mastery than if you just always treat it as, oh, I've never heard this sound. Um, I don't get it. Like, why, why is it this way? Yeah. Mm. So yeah, definitely don't have atama konkuri. <laughs> you can have atama sponji. <laughs> so kind of like a growth mindset, I guess, versus like a fixed mindset or like, oh, I am this type of person that kind of fixes you in that state. Is that my understanding of of what you, yeah, what you know. yeah, um, yeah. I didn't get my my joke landed kind of flat at the end there. Like like you're you're <laughs> instead of instead of having concrete in your head, you're just like brain should be a sponge, yeah, and just soak up whatever bits of knowledge uh, and language you can get. A growing sponge or a a a, pla a sp like one of those underwater sponges that grows, you know, like SpongeBob, I guess, or. I don't know if he grows. Does he grow? I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess my last question, just kind, of, you kind of, kind of touched on, was um, the importance of preservation, either linguistic preservation, architectural preservation, which you're doing as well. Uh, I have a yeah, a friend of mine. We were talking about he's got a kid, and you know, I was like, oh, what language are you going to have him speak? Because he comes from a multi-Asian family. His wife is a different Asian. He's a particular Asian. And he was like, well, you know, like, he doesn't think it's that important for him personally because he feels like, oh, you know, he, we're growing up in the U.S. I just feel like it's um, the last vestiges of holding on to some sort of cultural strain or, or, or thread. You know, it's a lot of effort, you know, why not have, you know, why not have my kid take a critical thinking class or something else? Because, you know, language is good for critical thinking. Why, why not just take a critical thinking class? And I found that interesting because, um, and I shared, you know, yeah, before I share kind of my own reasons. Uh, yeah, did you have any thoughts on that before we move on to language corner? Yeah. We've had a language corner for like last two hours. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I have some words I want to get off my chest, though, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would say, um, I'm, I mean, I'm the product of a multicultural marriage, right? And, um, I guess Dan is kind of that way too. I remember in one of the earlier episodes, Dan was saying his mom kind of like took it upon herself to teach you Japanese because nobody else in the family would. Right. So, uh, um, yeah. And, and I know a lot of people who are kind of like my mom, Japanese women married to Taiwanese men, and they live in Taiwan, and it's just a huge headache for them to figure out what language to raise their kids in. And um, I don't know if this is kind of a, a holdover from the everything, 
everything American or everything Caucasian is good. Everybody <laughs> wants their kids to be good at English, but at what cost? You know, so like my English is really good. My Japanese and Chinese are not by comparison, but everybody thinks they're good. Like they give me the benefit of the doubt that way because I'm of Japanese and Chinese descent. And so there's a lot of assumption going on. And I, I wonder if it's, if it's because we've weighted certain languages as being better than others when maybe we shouldn't have. Uh, but, but there's definitely a cost and, and there's definitely a, a choice that kind of needs to be made because James, like when you were growing up, you were speaking all of them and then like nobody understood what you were saying. Right, right. right. So, so, that's the other, so that's the other side of that. Uh, and a lot of people think like, oh, the benefits of bilingualism, um, you should speak another language, you should learn another one because everybody knows being bilingual is better than being monolingual. But there's such a thing as being half lingual when you're not good in either one. So that's yeah, I don't know if that's a that answers your question, but those are kind of my that's why I won't have kids. I don't want that I don't want to have that problem. <laughs> Speaking of kids, Dan. <laughs> yeah. What's your thoughts on this question, particularly as a father? Um, I mean it just depends on what the parents want to do. It's it's a lot of effort on the parents' part. And because my, my parents were immigrants, it's easier for them just to speak their natural tongue and not worry about the English. And their thoughts were like, oh, you can learn English at school. So English was my third language, and that's just the way it is. I, I tried teaching um, my first son Japanese when, when he was younger, and he actually picked up some, some vocabulary, but he lost it really quick you know, as soon as he got once he started speaking. My, since my mom's around these days, uh, we, me and her speak a lot of Japanese around the kids, and they're always wondering what we're saying. And I, ah. I just tell them some random stuff, and they don't—they know that I'm just like pulling their leg. But I tell them, if you want to know, then you gotta go learn language. Mm. Maybe, maybe, yeah, language, yeah, yeah. Survival. Yeah, but I mean, uh, to your point, Emmy, about half lingual. My uh, my youngest brothers, both my younger brothers, they went to ESL. You know, they had to take ESL, and their their language skills were not good until they were at six or seven. So it, it happens. Yeah. My dad, I, I joked with my sister, my dad is half lingual in a bunch of languages because <laughs> his Cantonese has, like, some weird accents or some weird words that he pronounces funny. And even though I don't speak Cantonese too well, I can pick that up. And then when I hear him speak Japanese, I go, oh, you don't sound like a Japanese person either. And then when he speaks Mandarin, he still like says he mispronounces things all the time. So, he's, so maybe for our uh, language corner, we should just make up words and make everybody else say them. Atamia <laughs> Kankuri. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I think, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe they, maybe the kids can pick it up like piecemeal from from your conversation, kind of like what my what I like maybe I mean and I. We heard our parents speaking Taiwanese. Maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe they. Maybe they'll. Maybe the your kids might pick up some Japanese. Maybe hopefully. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. All right, let's move on to uh, language corner. Yay! <laughs> um. So I prepared some words. Um. You. You know. You guys feel free to share any that you might have. You don't feel pressured. Um. Let me see. Uh. Okay. Here, here we go. How is this? How you? How do I say this? Okay. So try, try to guess the, the 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 language and what. Okay. Niho. Niho. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, Yay. Question. Niho. <laughs> niho is uh niho in Hakka. Hakka is a language from uh, Kaja Lim. I'm actually part Kaja, and basically. The Hakka people are also known as it's it's kind of a pejorative. It's means guest people because they themselves are a migratory nomadic um, ethnic group. Uh, they don't really have a place I guess they would call home. Uh, but there is a large Hakka community in Taiwan, and so um, and they're they're very. Uh, I think I got this from your article, Emmy, that they're very adamant about uh, preserving their language because they don't have a place. They don't have a physical space. But they have a linguistic space that they still want to hold on to. Am, am I correct in saying that? 
Yeah, there's a Hakka saying, which is basically our language is our inheritance. Mm. And because in China, especially a rural community, your inheritance is definitely the land that your family owns. So that so the land gets passed down. Mm. And 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 as as being kind of a nomadic group, they didn't have land as a as a luxury, as a as, as an option for, yeah. for inheritance. So so that's why they said, okay, well, language is that then. Cool. I got two more. Okay, guess what this means. Um, An zi se. An zi se. Yes. Is this a Chinese one? No, it's this is all Hakka. Oh. No, I don't know Hakka. No, An, An zi se means xie xie, or like, thank you. Yeah, An zi se. So completely different sounding, huh? It's, yeah. Yes. The first one sounded a little bit similar, but... Um, Okay, last one. Let's see. Uh, sit bao ma. Sit bao ma. Yes! Yay! One point yes! for Emmy. Yay! <laughs> Emmy's the winner, actually, because I got minus one last time. So, okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, sit bao ma, it means zi bao le or jia ba bui in Taiwanese or uh, Taiwanese uh, Hokkien. Jia ba bui. So, yeah, uh, that's Hakka. I, I think. Because my dad has a uh, Hakka heritage, you know, like there's certain like um, associations you can join as long as you have some lineage, you know. So he he's like part of. The, I I didn't know this until I was adult. I was like, wait, dad, why do you keep getting these letters from like Hakka people? It's like, oh, James, we're part Hakka. I'm like, what? And that's how I found <laughs> out I was part Hakka. You know. Um, anyways. My life has been a lie. <laughs> I'm part Hakka. Why am I so bad with money? <laughs> Because like the stereotype is the Hakka people are good with money, but um, anyways, uh, okay. Uh, any language corner from from either of you? Yeah. Emmy. Uh, I have one. Damn, do you know this one? Uh, Chimpun Kampu. No. In Japanese, it means I have no I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, Chimpun Kampu. And the kampun. interesting thing about that is it actually comes from Chinese because mm. there was a lot of trade going on. Uh -huh. And Japanese traders, kind of like the Silk Road situation, Japanese traders would go into China and they're saying stuff and it's not getting through. So they're writing stuff down and that's not getting through. So on the Chinese side, they say, Timputong, Kampputong. Uh -huh. And then the Japanese heard that and went, they're saying, Chimpun, Kampun. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chimpun, Kampun, is, is that really a Japanese uh, phrase then? or? Wow, and that means... Yes, I didn't just make that up, like stupid Atama Konkuri. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, well, that's it's, cool. It's every culture has an equivalent. So it's basically like, like it's Greek to me. So every, so all across the Mediterranean, there's like an equivalent of it's Greek to me. Where, or I think in some, the opposite side of that, it's Turkish to me or something. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's per <laughs> Persian to like... Like every culture has some major trading partner way, way, way back where they couldn't figure out by speech or by text um, what what was going on, but they but they had but they had to figure it out. And so so through those situations they have something like a chimpun kampun. Ah, cool, <laughs> very cool. Uh, Dan, anything? Yeah, um, so these are Japanese borrowed words. First one, bonetto. Do you guys know what bonetto is? Yes. A Emmy? bonnet Hat. or? Bonnet. Uh, yeah, but it's actually related to the car. car. <laughs> it's the hood of the car. Oh. A bonnet. Yeah, because cars went into um, the Japanese people who went to, like during the Meiji period, they went to England to study architecture. So they picked up a lot of British English and brought it back. Yeah. Oh. And then, so the second one is punk. I have a punk. Punk at, at the. Oh, punk. flat tire. Yeah. It's a short for a puncture. Oh. Punk. I only know that because I, when I worked with some Japanese people, they were like, yeah, you know, I, I had a flat. I, I told the people, I was like, I have a punk. I have a punk. And they didn't know what it was. <laughs> I got a punk. But, yeah, American English, we have a flat. But in, I guess, British English, they have a puncture. Punk. Yeah, you know, um, sorry, did you have another one? No, uh, yeah. well, I, production, production, Curfaction? it's also car related. 
Oh. Yeah. Traction? No, production. Production is horn. It's a horn for the car. Oh. Production. Oh. What? I don't. I that one I don't get at all. Production. I don't either. Yeah. I know that that's the word for it. Production. Production. Um, that made me think of, uh, ramen. Which yeah. I I thought ramen. that was an I thought that was a native Japanese word, but I guess it's not. Ramen. Ramen. The cold rolls. So yeah, I, I really for the katakana. longest. Well, sorry, say that again. It's written in katakana. Yeah, it's, I, I didn't. Well, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't learn Japanese until like way later. And it, so when I heard it, I thought, oh, la mian. Oh, the Chinese stole it from the Japanese, right? But no, no, it's it's the other way around. Yeah, because yeah, I'm yeah. so used to like because in the you, you know Dan like in America. Ramen is it's so it's associated with Japanese so yeah. you know strongly, but then la mian you know you don't you don't really know what that means unless you speak Chinese I guess or like cold noodles you know yeah 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 cool awesome okay. I think this was a very thorough podcast I think we covered a lot um, thank you so much and and uh, may, may I speak to your to, to Esther is that okay Emmy or <laughs> <laughs> is Esther still there or is she asleep or I think her hands fell off though because <laughs> she's been typing so hard. Oh my gosh! Um, thank you so much, Esther, for for accompanying our linguistic hour fifty plus podcast. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I made. What's that? <laughs> I made her be here. <laughs> oh, you made her be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we appreciate your your tenacity and your your diligence. I guess. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. and thank you emmy for Thanks, for Esther. contacting us and for sharing your knowledge i think uh, the work that you're doing architecturally and linguistically I, and also you're also doing work in the music space as well i think it's very interesting and um you know i th i don't want to say i guess you're interested in many things i think that might be a better way to describe than saying giving you like oh you're a polymath because i think i understand that because we had a polymath before saying saying uh chen and uh uh, that's a title that I gave him because that's how I thought of him. But I don't think he himself would call himself that because you know, uh, humility. I guess it's part of our culture, <laughs> our cultures. Um, but yeah, I think that. The, well, thank you, thank you for the compliment. Yeah, yeah, I, I find it interesting that you're interested in many things, and uh, we don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you both so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good Bye. one. Bye. Mm -hmm.